Good afternoon, lads and ladies. Welcome back to Calc 1. Today we're going to continue talking what we've been talking about, which is um, integration by the method of use substitution. I want to get us a lot more practice. Um, and specifically today, we're going to see how to handle definite integrals. And uh, I'm rubbing my forehead a little bit here because what I'm going to show you today might disagree with what you've heard from calculus teachers in the past just a little bit. There's a step here that some people consider optional that is not optional. There's a step here that you need to do. And your Calc 2 professors will, if they're in any way decent, absolutely require this of you. Um, so yeah, let's get moving. You'll recall that U substitution is like a backwards chain rule. You know, we have a backwards power rule that we use for integrating power functions. Uh, we have lots and lots of little tricks algebra wise that we can do, but the U substitution is our <clears throat> most powerful one yet. And it is a backwards chain rule. Uh, this of course is Mac 2311 section 004. It is the lecture on the day before Thanksgiving, which is 112520. And I really do appreciate you guys being here despite the time proximity to the holiday, it shows a great deal of responsibility and uh, I, it means a lot to me. So thank you. Thank you for coming um, today. We're going to talk about more substitution. Uh, last time, We talked about how you can take an integral that's of the form f of g of x times g primed of x dx and rewrite it as the integral f of u du by making the substitution u equals g of x, calculating the differential du as g primed of x dx. And we like to put this substitution work in a box because it's usually not very obvious uh, and then rewrite our integral. Uh, the important rules first, um, never mix variables. Um, you cannot do a goddamn thing until all the X stuff is gone, right? So if there's any bit of X stuff floating around after you try to make your substitution, you've got a combination of U stuff and X stuff. You need to stop what you're doing, figure out how to rewrite that X stuff in terms of the new variable U, and then proceed. Never mix the new variables with, excuse me, hiccups, with the old. Two. Never ignore or forget the differential, which is the dx, du, you know, the dz stuff. These are so goddamn important, right? Without these, we are in a lot of trouble. Um, and you need to have the appropriate piece floating around in your original integral uh, in order to make the differential piece go through, right? So if u is g of x, then du is g prime of x dx, which means if you want to substitute for the inner function here, you need to have its derivative or something very close to it floating around out here. Um, we saw a handful of examples of this last time. We're going to take a look at one or two more and then um, and I will, I will move on to the new material. This time uh, today, we're going to be talking specifically um, substitution in the definite integral. Now, um, like I said, before I start talking about substitution in definite integrals, I want to look at just one or two more examples of the types of things we did last time. So an example of the sort of thing we were doing last time, I could ask you to integrate um, 
and something like this. No, I'm kidding. Please don't do that shit. That's so distracting. Sorry, my cat's driving me nuts. Okay, so if I asked you to integrate x cubed over one plus x to the six dx, um, this is something that we'll we'll use a little substitution on. It's it's not as easy as the problems we started with yesterday. I'm starting with something slightly harder. Um, any ideas? Actually, let me let me make a little change here. Yeah, I'll, I'll strike this whole thing. We'll start on a separate page. I'm sorry. I want to make this substitution a little easier to spot. So let's let's start with this one. Um, yeah, why not? Uh, all right, let's start with this one. I want to integrate 3x squared over 1 plus x to the 6. Any ideas how we can use a substitution to make this integral look nicer, to make it look easier? Kirika, I love you. I do. Oh, I know you're a big girl, yeah. You're a big girl, but you're making really annoying noises. Okay, I love you, kitty. I love you, get the fuck out. Any thoughts? Did you say u equals x squared? u equals x squared is an interesting thing. Um, we could try that substitution, but I don't think it will really help. Um, Jonathan, renormalizing is something that we do when we're trying to take limits at infinity. Here, I'm not, not interested in taking any limits. Um, maybe an algebra trick like that could be useful, but I think there's a better path here. Let me just see. One plus x to the six with you. Try. I'm sorry? Substitute one plus x to the six with you. Mm. Okay, let me try. We've got two suggestions so far. One of them was to substitute u equals x squared. Another one was to try substituting for the whole bottom. Uh, I'll use a different letter for this. How about w equals one plus x to the six. I'm gonna try each of these and kind of show you guys what these can look like, um, you know, when you're just trying stuff without necessarily knowing what to do for sure. If u is x squared, then du is two x dx, right? So here, I would get what? Where do I have things that I could write like this? Well, my 3x squared upstairs, that would become 3u. My 1 plus x to the 6 downstairs, x to the 6 is x squared cubed. So this would be 1 plus u cubed. But then what do I do with my differential? See, I still have a dx here. And even if I were to try and make this nice, like I, so I've done this thing, right? I'm mixing variables. I've got u stuff and I've got x stuff. This is a problem. Now you can solve this for dx and you'll get 3u over 1 plus u cubed. dx is 1 over 2, uh, 1 over 2x du. Now I've gotten rid of my dx to replace it by a du, but I've got this 1 over 2x. So again, mixing variables, very, very dangerous. Is there any way to make this better? Is there any way to get rid of this x and replace it with its equivalent stuff in terms of u? Remember, it has to be all u stuff before I can do any integration. So I need to get rid of all the x's. Can't have any dx's, can't have any x's. So from this line to this line, 
I took this equation, du equals 2x dx, and I solved it for dx. This means 1 over 2x du is equal to dx. So this dx becomes this. But now I still have a mixture of variables here. I've got this all in terms of u. I've got my du here, but when I replaced dx by its du equivalent, I introduced this 1 over 2x. The 2 isn't a problem, but the x is. How do I get rid of this x? We did this in two different integrals yesterday, or Monday. If you have extra x stuff or original variable stuff floating around after you try to make a substitution, how do you get rid of it? Look back at your notes from last time. Can you move it like to the, to the outside? No, it's not a constant. Constants can come out, sure, but x is not a constant. Look at your notes. Look at notes from Monday. The very last problem we did had this. Uh, so did the second, the third to last problem. You go back to your substitution. Multiply the whole thing by its uh, derivative. Mm, can't do that. Now you go back to your substitution and you solve the substitution u equals x squared for x. This means the square root of u is equal to x. So I can then rewrite this as 3u over 1 plus u cubed times 1 over 2 square roots of u times du. Right? If u is x squared, then x is the square root of u. So this x is really a square root of u. Remember, fractions are grouping symbols. This is really like this. I can pull out the constants. There's a constant multiple 3 upstairs as a factor, a constant multiple 2 downstairs as a factor. And then I can multiply these fractions straight across. But you got to ask yourself, is this easier than the integral I began with. This is correct now. We did, we were able to force that substitution to go through. But is this easier than what I started with? No. No, it's not. No, I would contend that this is much harder than what we started with. Certainly it doesn't look easier to me. So I'm going to say, just based on how hard the resulting integral looks that we're going to stop here. Remember what's going on here. The issue is that we didn't have the piece we needed for our differential. When we solved for the differential to plug in, we introduced this extra x, which made things even harder. Now, what if we tried this other substitution? then dw would be 6x to the 5 dx. What's wrong with this? Well, if I try plugging things in, then I'll have 3x squared over u dx, right? Just plugging in the bottom is u. I need to replace this dx by, I'm oh, sorry, w. This is w. We use the symbol w here, not u. I need to replace the dx by its equivalent form in terms of w. We could try that. So one, just solve for dx, divide both sides by 6x to the 5. You get 1 over 6x to the 5 dw equals dx. So OK, one little bit at a time. But I've got all these mixed variables here. This is bad. And then 1 over 6x to the 5 dw. You can actually cancel the x's here. You can bring out the 3 over 6. And then x squared over x to the 5, that will leave 
I've got this here, and then I'll have 1 over x cubed dw. But look at this. This is not easy to rewrite in terms of w. You could come back here and solve this equation for x and then cube that and put that in here. But we've got the same problem here. We've got mixed variables. And getting rid of them will be hard. And if we did it, the result, the resulting integral looks harder than the original. So neither of these were bad ideas, right? These were both kind of reasonable things to want to try. But when we actually try either of them, the problem goes all cattywampus. It looks fucking gnarly. It doesn't look good. You can always solve your differential for dx and then try to plug that in. That's what we did here. That's what we did here. But then the result, if you didn't choose your substitution really well, the resulting integral, one, will have a combination of both variables, the new variable and the old variable. New variable and the old variable. That's a big no-no, right? I mentioned that on Monday and at the start of class today. The most common mistake is like making a, an unfortunate substitution, mixing up your variables, and then panicking and forgetting what to do. There was a suggestion that we try to pop this out. We can't do that because it's not a constant. Only constants can pop out. So neither of these are going to be the right path, right? Both of these substitutions lead me down a nasty road full of things I've been told to avoid. And both of them end up making the integral look harder. If you did solve this for x, you would get x equals the sixth root of w minus 1. If you then cubed that and put it in here, you would have only w stuff. But it would look horrendously complicated, similar to how this looks horrendously complicated. We don't want that. So let's try a different substitution. Does anybody else have any other ideas what, what we might try substituting for here? We tried substituting for the whole bottom. We tried substituting for x squared. Anyone got any other ideas? Remember, you want to be thinking of this as the integral of f of g of x times g primed of x dx. You want to look for an outer function and an inner function such that the derivative of the inner function is already here. What if I rewrite it like this? Um, inverse trig is looking a little too far forward. What is 3x squared the derivative of? What is this the derivative of? Or what is this the differential of? There's something here that's kind of begging me to make a particular substitution. If this is g primed of x dx, then maybe my inner function is x cubed. Yeah. And look more closely. Closely. Uh, this is 1 plus x cubed squared, isn't it? That's what x to the 6 is, times the derivative of x cubed. This is begging for me to substitute z equals x cubed, because then dz is 3x squared dx. That's exactly what I needed right here. And no funny business. I've got something here that will just give me 1 over 1 plus 
z squared, and then this shit is exactly dz. That's how you know you're on the right path, when the substitution works out nicely. You don't have to force anything through by going back and solving and trying to plug in and, and make things go away. Sure, sometimes that's necessary, but you should look for things that go nicely. And this is something that goes very nicely. What were the hints? Trying to see this as f of g times g primed, an outer with an inner, so one over one plus stuff squared, where the inner is derivative is floating around to be soaked up with the differential term. Look how much cleaner this is than any of the things we got with our other two attempts. What's more, you know who differentiates to one over one plus z squared. Who is this? Somebody said something about inverse trig. Jonathan, whose derivative is one over one plus z squared? What inverse trig function? Uh, I think Josh beat you to it there. Yeah, arctan, inverse tangent. This is the inverse tangent of z plus c. And then our last step is to go ahead and plug in what is z? Oh, well, z was x cubed. So this is a great example of what's not really a hard problem, but you need to look at it from the right way. You need to start developing the sense of smell, where you can see a function as composite times the derivative of the inner. I think the most important single step here is not a calculus step. It's going from here to here. If I gave you this problem written like this, I think everybody would see the substitution right away. But I don't have to give you the problem like that. I can give it to you like this. The steps from here to here are just baby algebra steps. There's nothing crazy, no calculus at all. And from here, it's easy to see that your inner function is x cubed. Look, there's his derivative sitting nice and pretty with the differential ready to go for this substitution. So we got to start developing that sense of smell. Questions on this? Another thing to be thinking of is your list of known integrals, right? If you're having trouble deciding what sort of substitution to make, you should keep in mind the stuff you know how to integrate because your substitution should be trying to turn your integral into one of these where you know what to do, right? If you're introducing all sorts of wild products of square roots and shit, then you know that's, that's not likely the path because the only things that you know how to integrate are things that look like this. So your substitution should be turning your integral into an integral that looks like one of these. All right, let's try one or two more. One of them that I put on your homework that I think most folks will need a little bit of nudging. It's a, a bit of a tricky problem. Um, let me make sure I get this right. tell you the wrong thing. And the exercise is here. It involves a sine of 2x over 1 plus cos squared, right? Is it not in here? Oh, yeah, there it is. I'm a big fan of number 39 and 40. These are both a lot of fun. Uh, let's do 40 first. So that's sine x over 1 plus cos squared x dx. And this is a nice follow up from the problem we just did. So remember, the goal here is to see it as an inner and an outer with the derivative of the inner floating around or something very close to that.
Oh, shit. I want you guys to stare at this for a second while I get my coffee cup replenished. Go ahead and type in the chat some substitutions you'd like to try. All right, I see two suggestions. Coast and coast squared, both look like fun to try. Well, rather than that, what happens if I try the coast squared substitution? Then du, we need the chain rule here, right? Would be two cosine to the one of x. And then by the chain rule, we multiply by the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine x, and then dx. So in other words, du is negative two sine x cos x dx. So downstairs there, I would have one plus u. Upstairs here, though, I don't know how to rewrite the sign in terms of this. This is a little confusing. And the dx is really quite gnarly also. All right, there's no clean way to make that substitution go through because of this differential. I only have a sign x upstairs. If you really wanted to try and force this, then you could say, okay, one over negative two sine x cos x du is equal to dx. So when you plug in here, I'll leave the top as a sine x. I'll do this mixing variables thing that we don't want to do times one over negative two sine x cos x du, you can cancel the sine x's and you would get one over one plus u times uh, negative one over two cos x is still down here and then du. You see so you have again this mixing of variables. which makes me sad. There's no nice way to get rid of this cosine. The sines cancel, but the cosines don't go away. So we're in trouble again. Uh, you could pop out the negative one half. One over one plus u is there. And then there is a way to do this. Cos x is the square root of u. So this is one over the square root of u du. And now we did manage to make it go through. We are able to get everything in terms of the new variable. But again, I need to ask, is this simpler than that? Remember, the integral can't be split up over multiplication. It's not like I just integrate this and integrate this. That doesn't work. So this is not any easier. So that's double sad face. So this isn't going to be our path. Now, the other suggestion was to try just substituting u equals cos x. Well, my office number is calling me now. So I'm going to have to answer this briefly. Hello? No, it's not. Spam on my office number. Great. So this substitution didn't work out nicely. 
We were able to force it to go through, but it didn't look nice. Well, trig identities won't get us out of the woods here either. Um, but what will work is the other substitution. What if I just try substituting for cosine? So I'll let w be cos of x, then dw is negative sine of x dx. And if you multiply both sides here by negative 1, you get that negative dw is sine x dx. So this sine x dx is negative dw. So a negative will pop out. And I'll have 1 over 1 plus w squared dw. Yeah. All right. The negative that was multiplying the dw, I just brought it all the way out. And so this is another inverse tangent thing. This is negative inverse tangent of w plus c, which is negative inverse tangent of cosine x. plus c. Cool shit, right? OK, the next example and the last example of an indefinite integral like this that I'm going to do is very similar. First, questions on this, on how we made this, this substitution solve the problem. I let w be cos x, so my bottom is going to be 1 plus w squared. The differential dw is negative sine x dx. So here, this sine x dx is negative dw. So I get my negative and my dw. If you wanted to, you could have taken the intermediate step of writing the integral as integral 1 over 1 plus cos squared x times sine x dx, right? Having the sine x upstairs is the same as having it over here. So your algebra chops need to be good. Okay. You got questions on how we made this work? I really want you guys to think with me here. OK, then last example of an indefinite integral. Sine 2x over 1 plus cos squared x. Just changing the sine x for a sine 2x. Any ideas? Anybody remember the double angle identity for the sine function? It's a nice one. Sine 2x is 2 sine x cos x. Does that look familiar? Anybody? Kind of looks like, kind of looks like the differential we got down here, doesn't it? When we substituted for cosine squared. Well, let me rewrite this integral. That's two sine x cos x divided by 
one plus cos squared x dx. And I know that this looks a lot like the differential I get if I substituted for cos squared. But if you're going to substitute for cos squared, why not substitute for one plus cos squared? Because the derivative of one is zero. In other words, here, I suggest trying the substitution z equals one plus cos squared of x. Because then dz, the one differentiates to zero, is going to be two cos x times negative sine x dx. And if you want, you can rewrite this. It's one over one plus cos squared x times two sine x cos x dx. You do need to get this clear in your head that being upstairs in a fraction is the same as being outside here. And this piece is not exactly dz, it's negative dz. So I make no bones about it. This substitution stuff, it's something new that you really need to learn. Okay, it's every bit as new and challenging as learning how to differentiate, it's, it's not easy. But if you put the time in, you'll develop a sense for it. And the sort of stuff we're doing right now is great practice. This is negative dz. This would be 1 over z. The negative from the negative dz, that's a multiple, can come out front. So I got negative integral 1 over z dz. Who has one over z as their derivative? What could I use for my antiderivative here? Natural log. Very good. This is negative natural log absolute value z plus a constant, which is negative natural log absolute value of one plus cos squared x plus c. So trig identities, while they weren't useful on that first one, they are useful here. And they will, in general, be very useful, um, especially in section 7.2 of the book, which is all on integrating trig functions. We don't cover that in Calc 1. We cover that in Calc 2. But it's the second or third thing you do in Calc 2. So you want these chops to be sharp. My advice to you, and I'm not bullshitting about this, solve all these problems, all right? You want to get good at this? You want to really learn this? Here's the trick. Solve them all and check your work. Don't just write down an answer that you think is correct and move on. Look it up in the back of the book. It's in the appendix or use Walker Malfa or something like that to check your work. But if you want to get good at this, solve all the problems. Now, we need to start talking about how to handle definite integrals here. Definite integrals, recall, are integrals with bound. The good news is it's not a whole lot different. The bad news is there's a step here that people seem to hate. So using substitution on definite integrals. Start out with a really simple example, try and motivate what I'm talking about here. Imagine I wanted to integrate um, x minus 2 raised to the 2020. And I want to do the integral from 2 to 3. Just to be clear, one of my options is to foil this some bitch out. Multiply x minus 2 by itself 2,020 times. I'm not in the mood. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm not in the mood to do that. Nobody should ever be in the mood to do that. It takes way too long. 
you know that definite integrals, just like indefinite integrals, are about finding an antiderivative. And you know that the substitution rule is a backwards chain rule. You know, if you had to differentiate this, you would sure should use the chain rule. You wouldn't multiply it all out and then use the power rule. So you should use the backwards chain rule here. What's the natural substitution? If I gave you this problem as an indefinite integral, what would you substitute for? x minus two is equal to u. Good, yeah, the natural thing to do here is to make the substitution u equals x minus two. And that's nice because du is then just dx, the derivative of x minus two is one. But because this is a definite integral, there's something else we need to do. You're going from the x f of x coordinate system to the u f of u coordinate system, and they are different coordinate systems. So you need to change your bounds. And I'm gonna draw a picture to make sense of this. The way I do it, I put a little vertical bar here. And then inside my substitution box to the right of this vertical bar, I say, okay, well, when x is equal to two, my old lower bound, u is equal to, I just plug the lower bound in here, two minus two, which is zero. So my old lower bound was two, my new lower bound is zero. My old lower bound was an x value. I'm integrating from x equals two to x equals three. So my new lower bound is a u value, it's zero. And when x is equal to three, u is equal to three minus two. Again, just plugging the x value in here. Three minus two is one. So my new integral is from zero to one of x minus two to the 2020, that's u to the 2020 du. Easy problem, u to the 2020, has as his antiderivative u to the 2021 over 2021. And it's a definite integral, so there's no plus c. You just evaluate between bounds. And you use these new bounds, not the old ones. Use the new bounds, 0 to 1. You don't need to go back to the original variable at all on definite integrals. Remember, this is just supposed to be a number. It's the area under this function from x equals three to x equals two. And what I'm doing when I say that this integral is equal to this integral, I'm saying that the area from three to two under this function is the same as the area from zero to one under this function. Let's draw the picture. First of all, I'll go ahead and do the evaluation here. You plug in one, you get one to the 2021 over 2021. Subtract what you get when you plug in zero, that's zero. So this is just one over 2021, nothing exciting. The pictures are exciting though. Here's the x axis. X minus two to the 2020 looks like this. You go right one, two units, one, two units. And he looks like a very flattened down version of x squared. And then he grows very quickly. So we're looking for the area from two to three. This is the graph x minus two to the 2020. Now, if I look at the u graph, my function here is just u to the 2020. That doesn't have the shift. It's just like the flattened down version of x squared with vertex over here at the origin. So to get this same area, instead of going from two to three, 
everything's been shifted left. Now I just go zero to one. You guys see it? This area is the same as this area because this function is just this guy shifted back over. When you do definite integrals, you must change the bounds. You don't need to go back to the original variable, right? I never went back and plugged in x minus two for u. It's silly to do that, but you must change the bounds. I'll be grading you on this. When you make a, a substitution in a definite integral, you must change the bounds. How do you change the bounds? We well, take your old lower bound and you plug it into the substitution. So my old lower bound was two. And when X is equal to two, U is equal to two minus two, which is zero. When X is equal to three, well, U is X minus two. So you would be three minus two, which is one. There is a very good website that talks about exactly why this is important. And they talk about what can happen when the differentials are more complicated also using really good pictures. Let me see, I think I bookmarked it. Well, no, bookmarks. Not the fun book, maybe. I think it, is. it might be this, let's see. No, it's not, damn. I know I bookmarked this. It's this. No, it's not that either. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'll have to dig back through it. I'll, um, I'll find that resource that I found a few weeks ago. I was excited to share it with you guys. I'm sorry, it's not, not where I thought it was. Um, but it's very important that you change your bounds. It's not hard to do. If you don't do it, your answer will be wrong. Your intermediate steps will not be equal to your original integral. So you always need to do this. No matter what anybody told you before about not changing bounds, going back to the old variable and then plugging in the original bounds, it's silly to do it like that. I'm not gonna say stupid, stupid is a mean word, but it's silly to do it like that. Do it like this. Let's try another example. What looks scary here, guys? Um, I think the definite integrals start here at number 55. So in the chat there, please tell me, of 55 through 73, what looks scariest? What do you want to try? If you don't care, just type a random number between 55 and 73. But if you do care, all right, yeah, good, let's do it. I can take a few more suggestions also, we do have time. So if there are any other problems from that list you'd like to see, please type the number. Just going straight for the end ones. 72 has got lots of extra parameters and it will do 73 first. That's the integral from zero to one of one over the square root of x, of one over one plus the square root of x, all to the four dx. And you're picking the challenging ones, 69, sure. Yeah, in fact, let me do 69 first. 69 is a little easier. Kind of warm you guys up a little bit. All right, uh, that's the integral from e up to e to the four of, they write it as, dx over x square root natural log x. All right, this is enough to get going. So my first step here would be to rewrite that as integral e up to e to the four, one over x square root ln x dx. That's more how we're used to seeing these. Um, Lower bound there is an E. You can see that my handwriting is quite poor. Any ideas what we should try substituting for here?
good, the natural log. And it can be made a little bit easier to see that by rewriting this as integral e e to the four, one over the square root of ln x times one over x dx. Everybody sees that these are the same? And now that one over x that I've grouped with the dx kind of is a strong hint to substitute for the natural log. Because if you make u equal to ln of x, du is exactly one over x dx. So this is the stuff I need to make this substitution. That's a good hint. Now I need to also change my bounds. My old lower bound is e. My old upper bound is e to the four. So my new lower bound is what I get when I plug in e for x in my substitution. u will be the natural log of e, which is one. And my upper bound, u is the natural log of e to the four, which is four. So my new integral will go from one to four. And what would that integrand be? So I've got one to four. One over the square root of natural log x becomes one over the square root of u, because u is ln x. And one over x dx is exactly du. This is convenient. Now I do know how to integrate this. One over the square root of u all on its own like that is u to the negative one half power. So this is integral one to four u to the negative one half. I can use my power rule on this. You add one to the power, negative one half plus one is positive one half. You also divide by that new power. It's a definite integral, so we don't need a plus c, but we do evaluate between these new bounds. And I'll say it one more time. You must change your bounds. You must use the new bounds in your new integral. And then you evaluate your antiderivative between those new bounds. You never plug back in for your old variable. You only do that with indefinite integrals. With definite integrals, you just change the bounds and move on. Okay, dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. So this is two square root of u evaluated from one to four, which is two times the square root of four minus two times the square root of one. The square root of four is two, so this is two times two, which is four minus the square root of one is one, so this is two times one, which is two. Four minus two is two. That's job done. Questions on this? Okay. Um, then let's try this guy. This guy's a little harder. Any ideas what we can substitute for? I don't have any pieces floating around that I could hope to use with my differential, do I? Uh, U equals X. U equals X doesn't change anything. U equals X just relabels all the X stuff as U stuff, but it doesn't make the problem any different. Yeah, the move here, and it's not an obvious one, is to substitute either for square root X or one plus square root X. Let me just try the square root X substitution on its own. That's X to the one half, right? So then DZ is one half X to the negative one half DX. 
And the challenge here is that I don't have anything looking like this over here to soak up. So this is one of those situations where your differential doesn't work out exactly right away. But we need to force it through. So first I'll multiply by 2, 2 dz, and then 1 over, uh, this is 1 over the square root of x here. And now I'll multiply both sides by the square root of x, and I get 2 square root of x dz is equal to dx. So I can plug this in here, but I don't want to because it has an x in it. So now what we do is we use our substitution. z is the square root of x. So this is 2z dz equals dx. So that's all of the bits I need besides changing the bounds to make the following substitution. I'll have 1 over z to the uh, 1 plus z. Oh, shit, yeah. 1 plus z to the 4. And then up here, 2z dz. But I also need to change my bounds. Now, when x is 0, the square root of 0 is 0. So z is the square root of 0, which is still 0. And when x is 1, z would be the square root of 1, which is 1. So it turns out my bounds don't actually change with that sub. So this is still a tricky integral. I can pop out the 2. And then I've got z over 1 plus z to the 4 dz. And that's still very tricky. I'll tell you what I would do if I encountered this is something different um, than what, what we did here. But there's a way to make it go from here. Can you make like another substitution from here or should you not do that? No, very good. Yes, that's exactly what we need. What other substitution could we make? Uh, I guess u equals one plus z. Good, beautiful. What's making this hard right now is the addition downstairs inside that power. Now, du here is just dz. The derivative of 1 plus z is just 1. And the bounds, when z is equal to 0, u is 1 plus z, so that's 1 plus 0, which is 1. And when z is equal to 1, u would be 1 plus 1, which is 2. So if here's my first substitution, here's my second substitution. Now I have 2 times the integral from 1 to 2. Downstairs there is just u to the 4. What about this? Well, if I solve this substitution for z, I get u minus 1 is equal to z. So this z right here is u minus 1. And dz is equal to du. The differential isn't hard this time. This integral is easier than this integral because I can now split this up. This is 2 times the integral from 1 to 2 of u over u to the 4 minus 1 over u to the 4 du. You can split fractions up over their numerators like this. You can't do it over the denominator, but you can do it over the numerator. So this is good news. Now u over u to the 4 is 1 over u cubed, or u to the negative 3. 1 over u to the 4 is u to the negative 4.
And now each of those is a little power rule. So this is a good example problem in that we do two substitutions. And you could have done them with one substitution at the start. We'll be clear about that. If you made the substitution that Daniel suggested, u equals one plus square root x, you could have gotten both of these done in one, but I think that makes it even harder to see what to do. Because you have to do all this complicated differential work um, either way. And that kind of makes it just a little bit too much to do at once. Antiderivative for u to the negative three, I add one to the power, that's u to the negative two, and I divide by that new power minus antiderivative for u to the negative four. I add one to that power, that's u to the negative three, and I divide by that new power. And all of this gets evaluated between these new bounds, one to two. So what is that? That's two times, by plugging two here, uh, maybe I should clean this up a little bit. This is negative one over two u squared plus one over three u cubed evaluated from one to two. So before I plug in the bounds, just cleaning up algebraically. And now, now I'll plug in my bounds. So two times one over two times two squared minus one over three times two cubed. That's my upper bound plugged in. Minus, I plug in my lower bound. Oh, this is negative. Negative one over two times one squared plus one over three times one cubed. And then we can simplify this, it's not that bad. This is negative one eighth. Uh, two cubed is eight times three is 24, so minus one over 24. Oh, uh, should this be a plus? Yeah, this should be a plus, shouldn't it? Because I simplified that to a plus here, so this is a plus. And then from that we subtract, one squared is one, so this is negative one half plus one third. And you can you can do the arithmetic from here. I would accept this um, unless there's some magical cancellation. Well, let's let's go ahead and do it. It couldn't hurt. So that's two times negative one eight plus one twenty four plus one half minus one third. Um, you can distribute the two. So that's negative one fourth plus one twelfth plus one minus two thirds. And I don't have a strong feeling about finishing this, but um, I guess 12 is our common denominator. So that's negative 3 plus 1 12 is negative 2 over 12 plus 1 minus 2 thirds, uh, which is negative 2 twelfths plus 12 twelfths. Minus and multiply by four, it's eight twelfths. So that's going to be positive ten twelfths here between these two, minus eight. So ten minus eight is two twelfths or one sixth. So that is where we land. Did I lose a negative somewhere? I think I distributed the negatives. Let's see. So this minus became a plus here. Okay, good. Yeah, I fixed it here, right? I originally wrote this as a minus, should be a plus. Okay, yeah, so I think we're good.
Okay. So this is substitution in definite intervals. Um, it's not it's not any harder really than substitution in indefinite intervals. The main challenge is figuring out how to make the differential work. There was one other problem that you guys said you want to take a look at, number 72 here. This is fun because we've got some extra labeled or named constants, but it's still the same thing. So this is the integral from zero to capital T over two of the sine of two pi little t over big T minus alpha d little t. Here we go. Yeah, the previous problem could have been done by combining the two substitutions in one. If you started with the substitution u equals one plus squared x, you could make it go through with a single substitution. But I feel like that's a pretty complicated thing to do in one step. So doing these with multiple substitutions is, is not a bad thing. If you see something that you can make work, go ahead and try that. And then if it doesn't get you all the way there, try something more. Um, it's better to take steps that you're confident in and then take more of them than take a big step that you're not confident in. But yes, could be done in one. Any idea what we could substitute for here? This one looks a little scary, doesn't it? I'll remember capital T is a constant. So capital T and alpha are both constants. The variable is little t, because we're integrating d little t. So our new variable needs to be some combination, mishmash of things involving little t. I'll tell you what I would like. I would like it if all this shit went away if I just had to integrate the sine of z or the sine of u. So maybe I'll try subbing for all that shit. Let's see. 2 pi little t over big T minus alpha. dz then is going to be 2 pi over big T. This is really a linear function, right? I can, I can show you why. Uh, z is two pi over big T times little t minus alpha. So when you differentiate this, this goes away, it's a constant. This becomes a one, so you just get two pi over big T. little t. We also need to change our bounds. Where did the alpha go? Like, how did you differentiate that? Alpha is a constant. Now the, oh. uh, so its derivative is zero. Yeah, I'm differentiating with respect to t, right? So anything that doesn't have a little t in it will differentiate to zero. So then my bounds, when little t is equal to zero, z is equal to two pi times zero over big T minus alpha. Well, two pi times zero is zero. Zero over big T is zero. So the new lower bound is negative alpha. And when t is equal to capital T over two, If I plug capital T over two in here, was my scratch work page I had a second ago. I'm gonna do it wherever. If I plug in capital T over two for little t, what do I get here? Well, this two and this two can cancel. 
So I get pi times big T over big T minus alpha. And then the T's cancel, and I get pi minus alpha. So when you plug in little t equals big T over 2 to this expression, you get pi minus alpha. So this is our substitution box. It's got all the good stuff that we need. My integral now runs from minus alpha to pi minus alpha. Sine of all this gobbledygook is sine of z. What about the differential? If dz is 2 pi over capital T times dt, then capital T over 2 pi dz is dt. Just multiplying both sides by the reciprocal of this constant. So here I'll have capital T over 2 pi little t. And this is a constant. It can come out. Oops, sorry, dz. Yeah, this should be a dz. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, that's the point. I solved this for dt, so I can plug this in for dt. And now the integral of sine z, who differentiates to sine z? That is one of our known integrals. That's negative cos z. And I evaluate this between bounds, negative alpha to pi minus alpha. And you end up with capital T over 2 pi times negative cos of pi minus alpha minus negative cos of negative alpha. And the truth is there's quite a lot of simplification that can be done here. If you're willing to use uh, some properties of trig functions, first the minus minus becomes plus. So this is negative cos of pi minus alpha plus cos negative alpha. Uh, then because cosine is even, I can replace this with cos alpha. Here I could use the difference formula for the cosine function and expand this, but honestly, Let's call it a day there. That's plenty good. So this has been a crash course in how to substitute in integrals. Substitution is a hugely powerful method. We spent two days on it. I could easily spend two more days on it. Um, you need to solve a lot of problems to get good at this. And you need to get good at this. There's no escaping it. Exam three and the final will have plenty of substitution problems on them, and you can expect to see plenty more in Calc 2. Substitution is a method I use in Calc 2 pretty much every day. Um, we focus on it a lot at the beginning of the class, um, but we use it continuously through the whole semester. So you, you must develop this skill. And my suggestion really is to solve all the problems in section 5.5. Test three is the last day of class. Friday, December 4th. Um, which page? They are on 419 in the textbook. It's section 5.5. Um, looks like there's some problems on page 418 also. Yeah, you can start here. First few, they'll tell you what substitution to make, and then the rest of them, you're on your own. We do not have class this Friday. The college is closed Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. So um, our next class meeting will be next Monday. Now, what will happen this Friday, I'm going to publish the study guide for exam three this Friday. Uh, and you want to get a, a start on that over the weekend. OK?
So no class Friday, but I will be publishing study guide Friday. We have regular class next Monday and next Wednesday, and then exam three is next Friday. The final exam for you guys is going to be on December 7th at 1 p.m. If you haven't already done it, please put an alarm in your phone right now for this final, right? It's not our normal time. It's at 1 p.m. It's at a weird time. I'll be posting announcements, but you need to, to get that in your brain, get it in your phone. Any other questions? All right then, lads and ladies, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy learning how to use substitution in these intervals. Don't think that just watching the lecture is enough. Watching the lecture is great, take good notes, wonderful. Um, but you also need to solve lots of problems on your own. Don't hack this homework, do this homework properly, honestly. It'll save you a lot of headaches in the next, next few weeks and in the first few weeks of Calc 2. Um, I hope you guys have a lovely holiday. Please uh, enjoy it, enjoy it safely and uh, be responsible. If you want to meet with me, I do have office hours this afternoon, um, or you can send me an email or canvas message. Bye, guys.